is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, His glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Hello, welcome to Until Ministries. Thank you for joining us. Well, today we're going to look at a beautiful verse from the book of Psalms and we're going to apply it to our lives. And um, I want to ask us all, I know the answer, I'm asking myself as well, do we have troubles? Do we have any troubles anywhere? I think we all do. You know, today's uncertain times of trouble and trial and tumult and tragedy, the Lord has a message for us. And that's what we're going to concentrate on today. And it comes from um, Psalm 56, 8, which uh, I'm going to read for us now. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful verse. Psalm 56, 8 says this. You have seen me tossing and turning through the night. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears and preserved them in your bottle. You have recorded each and every one in your book. Well, these were written by uh, King David, who wrote this psalm. And we're going to see that the Lord, what the Lord's saying to us is that he knows that we're going through troubles. Remember, Jesus said uh, in John 16, 33, he said, you're going to have troubles in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I've overcome your troubles. So um, the Lord is saying to us, I know about every one of your troubles. And he says, I've collected your tears and preserved them in the bottle. And, um, and you and I can receive great assurance and comfort during our own sorrows, during our own struggles, during our own fears and our own pressures by understanding and applying this scripture to our lives today. Well, first of all, we're going to look at the context. It's always important to look at the context. The context of Psalm 56, 8, there's a specific situation going on here. It's written by David, uh, as I said, and he has once again had to flee King Saul and also the Philistines. They're trying to kill him. And David, in this psalm, pleads for help with the many struggles that he's experiencing. He has also a petition for vengeance on his enemies, and um, he, he's frightened for his life at this point. So he, he is fleeing, and he's promising to pay his vows to the Lord, but he is fearful and running for his life. Now, this was probably written about the same time, if you know much about David. Uh, he had to, at one point, he had to feign insanity, uh, in order to escape his captors. And uh, so it's probably about that same time that this happens. And he's in a desperate situation, and it's indicative of the many situations that David faced in his life. Now, culturally, in, in the ancient East, mourners would cry over a wineskin bottle. In other words, if they were mourning the death of a loved one, they would cry over a wineskin bottle and then they would, which would collect their tears and they would leave their tears at the door of the tomb of the loved one. And that was an ancient custom. And that's why David's talking about collecting tears and God's, God and his infinite uh, nature and wisdom is collecting all our tears. We'll talk about that in a moment. But it's probably David's way of illustrating that he needs to have his troubles noticed and he needs to have his troubles remembered. And you and I have that need as well. We need to have the Lord be aware of what we're going through and know that he is. There's no question about it. He's omniscient. He knows you. He knows all about you. He knows your needs. He knows your problems. He knows your future. Um, he is all knowing. And so he is aware of our troubles. And David's saying, oh, I hope that you'll be aware of my troubles. Now, the thing is, we can apply these, this principle. And that's why we're given this message today. We can apply this, 
th this verse, this comfort, this wonderful concept, we can apply it to our own sorrows and we can apply it to our own troubles and to our own threats and fears and struggles with others. Um, and we can, we can also share this comfort with other people um, about God being aware. Um, and, and one of uh, a wonderful woman who is now with the Lord uh, loves this concept and uh, right up until the time of her death, I shared it with her again and again because she was so pleased. She had suffered for many, many years, physical suffering, and she was just so grateful that God remembered her tears and understood her problems. So uh, we want to apply this as we always do here on Until Ministries to our lives. So let's look now. We've looked at the context. Now I want to look at the content of um, the tears of David. And we're still looking at Psalm 56, 8. And the tears of David are representative of all the adversity that David faced throughout his life. You remember when he was a young lad, when he was a young shepherd, the Bible teaches that he protected his sheep and had to kill wild animals, including a lion and a bear when he was a young shepherd boy. And then the biggie when he came up against Goliath, the nine foot six inch giant that he slew with his, with his sling, um, David up against Goliath. And then King Saul, who was his mentor and his king, and he was supposed to be Saul's successor. Saul repeatedly trying to kill him. Uh, and that's where we are in this um, story today, or this context today. Um, and there, the Philistines trying to slay David were what, was really what gave birth to, I think, the writing of this, of this psalm. So um, we want to look at the content of uh, the tears of other people not just David, and including ourselves today. Many of you watching have experienced recent bereavement. Many of you watching or listening have had a serious illness or been involved with someone you love or are close to that has serious illness. Many of you watching or listening have disabilities or loneliness or discouragement or financial pressures, very common today. Uh, some of you have broken relationships, injustices against you, fears, addictions. Some of you watching or listening may be struggling with addictions even. Interpersonal strife. These are all things we face in life. And these things bring tears, don't they? All of these things we're talking about, whether it be bereavement or some kind of other struggle or loneliness, discouragement, it brings tears. And what your tears are today is what you want God to be aware of and to remember. Lord, remember my tears. Put them in a bottle. Um, understand them. Know about them, Lord. And, and the Lord, that's exactly what he does. He puts our tears in a bottle. Now, when it says he puts our tears in the bottle, and we read in 56, 8, Psalm 56, 8, it says, you have collected all my tears and preserved them in your bottle. You have recorded each and every one in your book. Well, I need to tell you that this is symbolic language. Um, you know, we know that there's all kinds of pictures of God with a big white beard and he opens his book and everything. God doesn't need a book to remember your tears. He doesn't need a book to know your name. He doesn't need a book to remember anything or to know anything about you because he has an unlimited mind. He is omniscient. He knows everything and his mind is unlimited. So it's language that we can understand. So he doesn't have a literal bottle or a little literal wine skin to put our tears into, but he remembers each and every tear. He knows what your problems are. He knows what you're struggling with. And <clears throat> whatever, whatever those are for you today, you particularly, rest assured that he will hear your prayer. Rest assured that he will remember your tears. Rest assured that he will put your tears in a bottle and trust him completely 
as David did. David trusted him completely, and you need to trust him completely too, and so do I. Well, now we want to look at um, the next item, on an, and, and that is the container. The container. What's this bottle that's being talked about here? Again, it's figurative when it concerns God, but in David's day, it, that's how they did it. It was real. Well, the container, again, was literally, it was most likely a wineskin made of leather. A wineskin such as Jesus talked about in the Gospels, Matthew 9, Mark 2, and Luke 5, when he was talking about that the old wineskins can't handle the new wine. Remember that? And what he was saying is, is that the new wine, which is the grace of Christ and the reality of Christ, cannot be put into the old wineskins, which were the old forms of the law. And so um, that's what the container was, literally. And remember, I told you that mourners in those days would put the tears, their tears as they mourned. They'd collect their tears, put them in the wineskin, and then put the wineskin at the door of the tomb to, to show um, respect and love and sorrow for the person who has gone on. But symbolically, um, this wineskin, this bottle that we're reading about, is the omniscient, unlimited mind of God. And David asks a rhetorical question to express confidence. He says, are they not in thy book? And again, he doesn't mean a literal book. I mean, are, are they not in your mind, Lord? Do you not remember them? Are they not there right where you are mindful of them? And God's totally comprehensive, totally unlimited mind. We can have that same assurance and trust that David did. David asked, he trusted so much, he asked a rhetorical question. You and I can have that same complete assurance, that same trust that he has taken note of. He has taken note of your needs, whatever they are. He has taken needs of your pain, of your hurt, of your sorrow, of your struggle, of your pressures, of your sadness, whatever it is. Have assurance and trust that he has taken note of all that you need and that he has remembered those needs and he has been aware of every tear that you have shed and he has collected them in the wineskin of his unlimited mind. Isn't that beautiful? It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? Well, now we want to move on to the consolation. And the consolation that David is receiving uh, in the psalm itself. But I also want to move to the consolation that you and I have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We move now to the New Testament. We're going to look at the book of Hebrews and we're going to see how God empathizes with us, how the Lord Jesus intercedes for us, and how he makes it possible for us to know that he is aware and we can come to him. And we're going to read some wonderful scriptures here as well. So we're going to look at Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. And then we're going to look at Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. Listen to this now. Now we're in the New Testament. We're in the book of Hebrews. Because God's children are human beings and made of flesh and blood, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power over death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the son did not come to help angels, he came to help the descendants of Abraham, in other words, his people. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be merciful and faithful as our high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Now here's a verse I want you to concentrate on. Since he himself, speaking of Jesus, since he himself has gone 
through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are tested or when we are tempted. You see that? He remembers our tears. He's aware of our hurts. And he has gone through everything that we've gone through except sin. And so he's able to help us when we're being tested or tried. Now listen to Hebrews 4, 14, 16. Same, same idea. So then, since we have a great high priest, meaning Jesus, who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. And all as a side, that's so important today. Stand firmly to what you believe about Jesus and about the Bible. It's so important. This high priest of ours, I get this now, he understands our weaknesses. He understands our weaknesses because he faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. That's the difference. He, sp he faced all the temptations, all the trials, all the testings that we do, except he did it without sin. And that, was, that is why he could be our savior because he lived a perfect life, because he's the sinless son of God. If he, if he were a sinner, and he gave in to temptation or he um, wilted under trial, um, he couldn't be our savior because he'd be in the same boat we are. But he never sinned in thought or word or deed. So then it says, listen to this now. It says, let us come boldly, let us come boldly to the throne of grace of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. There it is. The Lord, it's another way of saying, I know all about your tears. I, I understand your tears. I understand your needs. I know that you need help. And I will help you when you need it the most. I will help you when you need it the most. Oh, it's so beautiful. So anyway, let's go on then and see a little bit more about these verses. Um, Jesus, don't forget that Jesus faced adversity and hostility far beyond what we can even imagine. So he endured terrible hostility himself. So because of that, we can worship him and we can be thankful to him. And th that's what keeps us going. Uh, the Bible says that that's what... It keeps us from getting weary. Hebrews um, 12, 3 says that you remember all the hostility that Jesus endured from sin sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. You see, wow, you know, it's tough in this life, isn't it? All of you can agree with that. It's tough in this life, but it's nothing compared to the toughness that Jesus went through. So don't give up. Don't grow weary. He knows what you're going through. He remembers your tears. He's bottled your tears and he'll help you through it. So we don't need to lose heart. We don't need to give up. We don't need to grow weary in our trouble and struggles. Don't give up. Just keep pressing forward. In the, in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, in our own adversity, in the power of the Holy Spirit and to the glory of Christ, um, we can press on, but we can also help others on the way and sympathize with others. As Jesus empathizes with us and remembers our tears and is sensitive to our needs, so we can be like that with others. So we must strive in his power, not our own, we can't do it on our own, to be aware of the tears of others and to remember their tears and to try to help them, uh, help those who shed tears in whatever way that you can. The Bible says in Romans 12, 15, it says, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Oh, we can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's so, so important, isn't it? So, um, now we want to look at um, the idea of, again, reaching out to others that um, we do. We look at the book of uh, Philippians in a moment, and we'll see exactly what this says. Um, the book of Philippians, chapter 2, and verse, uh, verses 3 through 5, it says this. It says, do nothing from selfishness 
or vain conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another more than yourself. Do not look out for just your personal interest, but for the interests of others. Have this attitude in you, which is in Christ Jesus. What this verse is saying is that we should be sensitive to the tears of others. Just as we want God to remember our tears, we should be willing to remember the tears of others. This verse, these verses in Philippians say, don't be so wrapped up in yourself. Don't be selfish or wanting attention, but with humility, let each of you regard one another as more important than self. Do not look out for merely your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others, because this is the attitude that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, this is Christ's attitude that we are to follow. So we have to remember the tears of others. Now, I want to um, try to bring another aspect into this. Um, when we talk about how Jesus remembers our tears, um, we have to remember that Jesus him, himself shed tears. This is a verse that you can easily memorize. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, and it is Jesus wept. Jesus wept, John 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. And um, what was the occasion of Jesus weeping? Now, this is going to bring it all together for you. Jesus was weeping outside of the tomb of his good friend Lazarus, who had died. You remember the story, Jesus was off away from town, away from Bethany where Lazarus lived, and Lazarus became sick, and it took Jesus, it, it, Jesus deliberately delayed getting there. By the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days, and um, of course, Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, both said, hey, if you were here, Lord, this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus said, you know, about the resurrection in the last day, I am the resurrection and the life. And uh, they said, yeah, we know he's going to raise up at the end. And, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he proceeded to raise Lazarus from the dead, didn't he? But before he did, before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he stood outside the tomb and it says, Jesus wept. There's the tears outside of the tomb, just like the mourners in, in the ancient Middle East. They would cry into the wineskin, bottle up the tears in the wineskin, place it outside of the tomb. Here's the Son of God weeping outside of the tomb. Um, shedding tears, that's how he felt for the pain of Lazarus' family, for his own pain of his friend, um, and for all that knew and loved Lazarus. He remembered their tears and he shed his own. But also try to remember that not only was Jesus shedding his tears, not only was Jesus weeping because his friend had died, he was weeping in a larger sense because death was never God's original plan. God was never, uh, his original plan was not for people to die. It was only after man gave in to sin and man sinned and, there, and then they became mortal and they died. And we all will die unless the Lord comes before that time. But the point is, is that um, Jesus was weeping because it wasn't in his plan for man to die, but man chose sin, and because that, he died, and, and the Lord was weeping because of it. 
Um, it all comes together, doesn't it? The Bible is such a, such a wonderful, wonderful book. Well, I want to close with a couple quotations from um, some gifted um, Bible teachers, Bible scholars. And um, this, is, this first one is from Sarah Young um, in her devotional book entitled Jesus Always. Uh, many of you have read it. Many of you use it regularly. Jesus always. Um, and, and this is what she says about this passage. She says, I know about every one of your troubles. I have collected all your tears and preserved them in my bottle. So she quotes the verse. Now she goes on to say this. So don't be afraid of tears or the hardships that cause them. Your problems are not random or meaningless. This is the Lord talking. I'm calling you to trust not only in me, but also in my sovereignty. That means <clears throat> that we're calling, we're, that God is calling us to trust in him but he's also calling us to believe in his sovereignty, to trust in his sovereignty, meaning that he is in control. He is in control at all times. <clears throat> he is on the throne. And then it says, the Lord continuing, <clears throat> as Sarah Young comments on it, I know all things. I am in complete and perfect control. There it is. I have collected your tears because you are exceedingly precious to me. If you don't remember anything else from this sermon, remember that phrase today. God is saying to you, I have collected your tears because you are exceedingly precious to me. I know all about your needs. I know all about your pain. You are exceedingly precious to me. And someday I will wipe away all your tears. Wow, we look forward to that. Someday he'll wipe, all away, <clears throat> wipe away all our tears. There'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And we can rejoice in the glorious heavenly future awaiting us, if you know Jesus as your Savior. And finally, from Jill Briscoe, it says, Doesn't it help you to know that God sees your tears and writes them in his book in his infinite mind. And then she adds in a beautiful poem, listen to this now, that the Father collects and reads, if you will, our tears, and then he tilts the bottle of tears carefully over his book of remembrance. He feels your tears. He treasures them. He keeps them in a bottle and then he pours them out for you. And she concludes that our tears tell our story and that God listens to us and that we are heard. God bless you. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Oh, yes, come. Jesus.